We are happy along with student development, student government, the Office of Multicultural Development to uh, have this event about the Ferguson Commission and why it matters. So let me tell you how uh, the event is going to transpire tonight, then I'll introduce our participants. So after uh, each of the members of the commission uh, who's with us speaks for 10 minutes, then there will be a response by uh, Dr. Theon Hill from our communications department. And uh, then uh, last and certainly not least, uh, there will be a, a response by uh, Jay, uh, Josh Fort, and I don't want to call you Jay, Josh Fort, our student body president. <laughs> After which you get to join the conversation by asking questions. Notice that I use the word questions. So, uh, and I will, pr I'll, I'll just remind everyone about the word questions uh, when, when that time happens. But first, uh, let me introduce who, who will be speaking uh, in, in the order that you will hear them. First, we will hear from Felicia Pullum. She's from St. Louis. She actually lives in Ferguson. And uh, she's, she's been involved in many things related to poverty and economic development. And particularly, she's part of uh, for, not just the Ferguson Commission, but uh, a group called Focus. She's the director of development and a consultant for many uh, nonprofit organizations and local governments. Following her would be Kevin Albrand, uh, the father of a current Wheaton student who, who has 31 years experience in law enforcement and is currently a detective sergeant with the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department and deputy commander of the major case, guard, case squad of Greater St. Louis. And also, <laughs> the uh, current president of the Missouri Fraternal Order of Police. He has very busy weeks, I've learned. And then uh, the, uh, Rich McClure will follow them. Uh, he's one of the co-chairs of the Ferguson Commission and the parent of a 2008 Wheaton graduate. Uh, he just retired from being CEO of Unigroup and has had extensive involvement in public policy. It's a great opportunity for us to be in this event where we're not just talking about theory, we're talking about things that are happening on the ground. So I'm glad that uh, they will be here with us. And uh, I, I wanna give credit for this uh, to Jarrett Wilhelm, Wilhelm and uh, Paul Chelson uh, who, brought, who uh, came up with this idea because Rich approached them. So um, this is a great opportunity for Wheaton College and a great opportunity for our surrounding community. And I'm, I'm glad so many of you are here uh, to learn and here to, to bring your questions. So without further ado, we'll hear from Felicia. Good evening, Wheaton. Um, I am thrilled to continue this day with you. It's been a, a wonderful day of engaging with um, students, your professors, and your college leadership. I am encouraged by the work that is going on here <clears throat> and happy to be here with you this evening. So thank you so much, so much for having us. Um, it's been a very challenging year, and I know that this community has been through a few hiccups and challenges yourself, but that means that you're on the same journey that most of us across the country are on. A journey of, of learning, strategy, reconciliation, transformation, and it is difficult. <clears throat> I was sharing earlier, and it is the truth, that the events of August 9th revealed something new to me. Although I've spent 15 years working in distressed communities, working against poverty, and trying to bring um, people access and an opportunity to self-determine, that day was different. And the subsequent actions and activities in my engagement 
it was just different from the rest of the advocacy work that I've done around poverty and in distressed communities. The first thing being um, the morning of August 10. The morning of August 10, this is what made the work different. The morning of August 10, um, I was on my way to service. I really didn't know what had happened on the 9th and I was on my way to service and I saw some activists that I know from previous work and I thought, what are they doing here? That's interesting. And I was late, so um, I went to church. And there was some activity and some talking around that. But when I came back, there was this big crowd of about 30 faith leaders. And I was sort of surprised because it was, it was very interfaith. I used to work with Interfaith Partnership, Faith Beyond Walls. So I knew a bunch of those people. And I thought, well, what are they doing here on South Florissant? And then I found out what, what happened. And there was um, a prayer vigil, so I jumped right in. And then all of these young people came, and they were standing on the outside. They weren't really participating, and they were really quiet and respectful, and they just kept coming and coming. And I was looking, trying to figure out what was going on. And so this journey convened in prayer and went immediately to disruption, just as soon as the prayers stopped, the young people took over the street. They, there was the first die-in, and they took over the street and stopped the traffic, and that's when it, it was on. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's different. And I know these are difficult and challenging times, and we get weary sometimes, and I don't know um, how every single person came to be a member of the Ferguson Commission, but it's been my honor and pleasure to serve community in this capacity. Because we didn't know what we were doing, we just knew that we were called to do something. And um, in difficult times, it's nice to know where you stand. And in challenging times like this, it's great to know who you stand with. So I didn't know that when I met these wonderful people that are my colleagues on the Ferguson Commission. But that day, 16 strangers, relative, they were all strangers to me, um, gathered in a room. I didn't even know who else was going to be on the commission, um, let alone exactly what we were going to do, because I hadn't heard the charge yet. I just knew that I had been called to do this work. And um, we convened in prayer. And it was the same kind of chaos, right? There was lots of TV cameras and lots of lights and a whole lot of people and it was really noisy. And, but then we were in this really small space together and then thrown into the chaos. And so I was like, oh, I, is this a pattern? But I knew that um, on the days when it was really difficult and my, my heart was really heavy and we learned some, tragic things or something horrible happened. I could go home and weep and cry and be sad or angry or whatever it was that we were dealing with or I was dealing with. And remember that the people that I was doing the work with came to this mission the same way that I came to it. And so as students, when you're trying to find your way, how do I engage, what do I do, what does this mean? I just want to offer that for me, it was important to be able to get quiet sometimes and remember those two distinctive moments when it began, right? The, the protest um, and the unrest, the uprisings began and when the work, the strategy around solutions began, sort of in the similar fashion, but who was there? You know, who I was with in those moments um, and it's been, really helpful to me on this journey. Um, and I am hopeful. You make me hopeful. Um, the strategies that we've discovered in our learning. You know, I say as leaders, you get tapped a lot to come to the table and give your opinion and people look to you to give them an answer because that's what leaders do and then they do what you tell them to do, and that's what we like them to be, you know, get busy doing what we're asking them to do. But this was a totally different situation. It was a group of really diverse leaders from various perspectives 
we learned immediately that we had to stop and listen. For a long time, to a lot of people who needed us to hear their story, to hear their experience, and trusted us with their journeys, and they gave them to us. It was like a great gift from community, even when they were really painful and difficult lessons for us. Um, and, you know, as sort of custodians of that, I wasn't sure what we were going to do with all of it. But I would like to offer that um, Forward Through Ferguson is a culmination of all of that. And there are some calls to actions and some lessons in there. And I believe that it is an excellent resource for everyone that's sort of dealing with these very difficult situations um, these, in these difficult times. I knew I would be losing following either Rich or Felicia, so that's why they put me in the middle. I just want everybody to recognize I am wearing orange and blue tonight, so. Yeah. Um, I came to the start of this journey a little bit different, a lot different than Felicia did. Um, I was also in Ferguson on August 10th, but I was there as a police officer. Um, I spent the next, and I said this earlier, probably up until December 1st or 2nd, uh, almost every day in Ferguson uh, and or um, the city of St. Louis, which also had uh, several periods of unrest during that time. Uh, working probably 14, 16 hour days. So when, so when I got the call from the governor's office asking me to be part of the commission, um, I gotta be honest with you, I was emotionally and physically spent. Um, and I really, th and I talked to some of my friends and I said, uh, you know, you're gonna be the target, they're gonna come after you, why do you wanna do that? And so my wife and I prayed about it um, a lot and God finally just said, hey, Kevin, put on your big boy pants, of course, well, all of my pants are big boy pants, but, <laughs> um, you know, God said, go and do it. So I did it, and, and I'll tell you what, the first uh, two or three meetings were rough, uh, really rough. Uh, when we say we listen to uh, the community, we listen to the community, and we had to listen to them because they were screaming, and, and, and we heard them loud and clear, and they told us what uh, we should do. Um, spent the next, how many commission meetings do we have, Rich? 19, 19. 19 full commission meetings, uh, listening to the community. Uh, um, then we broke out into, into working groups. I was part of the uh, Citizen Law Enforcement Working Group. We listened to the community there. And you know what, there was a lot of, uh, not just between myself as a police officer and the community, but even amongst commissioners, hey, there was a lot of, uh, what are the word we use? Robust, robust, <laughs> robust. discussion. Um, but what it comes down to is everybody wants the same goal. Uh, the means to come to that end might be a little different, but we got together and we reached a collaboration of how we think we should get to that area. Now, I don't agree with, with everything that was in the report and let the commissioners don't agree with every, all the things that I wanted in that report, but we got it out there and I think that's really what what this community needs. Um, I say this a lot, and, and it sounds simplistic, but relationships are, are the key uh, for all of this. The relationships between uh, law enforcement and the community, uh, those relationships have been broken over the, over the past 20 years. Uh, I believe there are various reasons for that. Relationships between uh, individuals. Um, one story um, I tell is, uh, but this is how diverse the commission is. Here I am, a 30, 31 year police officer, and then we have Rasheen Aldridge, who is a 21 uh, year old protester who I saw on the front lines on the protests. Rasheen actually said, hey, if that cop's gonna be on the commission, I don't know if I'm gonna be on it. I don't know if I can work with him. 
Um, so I asked the Reverend Starsky Wilson, uh, one of our co-chairs, I said, hey, Starsky, can you broker a meeting with me and Rasheen? And so we went and, and met for coffee, and that was a two and a half hour long cup of coffee, and, and I firmly believe that, that it's all about relationships because I didn't know Rasheen and Rasheen didn't know me. Uh, it gave us a chance to uh, talk to each other. Hey, what, what, what are your concerns with us? Um, and, and I could explain some things, and I said, Rasheen, this is what our concerns are, are with you. And it's about building those relationships and making those relationships strong. And um, those are the kind of relationships we made on the commission also. Uh, I didn't know, I don't think I knew anybody. Uh, well, Scott Negworth, because uh, Scott was a couple years ahead of me in high school. That was it. But I can tell you, um, it's the most rewarding experience I've ever had in my life. <clears throat> and you will get the opportunity to be, hopefully, to be involved in something life-changing like this. I know you can at Wheaton. There are, there are opportunities out there for you uh, abounding. But uh, we think we really made some great recommendations. I can tell you that uh, uh, the citizen law enforcement recommendations, especially the, some of the legislative ones, we've already, we can already make check marks, and, and we're, we're, we're moving full ahead on that. Uh, we're committed to this. Um, like I said, I've made lifelong friends on this commission. And because it's important work that we did, and it's about talking to each other, getting to know each other, and we all want the same uh, end, and let's get there. And it takes hard work. It takes tough conversation. Uh, we had it. We got through it. There's a lot more tough conversation to come, but I, I believe we can do it. Thank you. If, uh, if you want to uh, see a great uh, vignette and a picture into Kevin and Rasheen's relationship, you can go to forwardthroughferguson.org. And uh, there are, I think, now maybe 50 or 60 stories that have been posted on that website. So it's more than just a report, and the report's a living report. We, we post new things periodically. You can sort it any way you want to. It's digital, so it lives in the cloud. It can't sit on a shelf and gather dust. And so among these 50 or 60 stories is a video called Kevin and Rasheen, in which one of the moments that I love most, Rasheen looks at Kevin and says, Kevin, I thought you were public enemy number one. <laughs> Sorry, but that's what I thought. And then the video goes from there to describe the incredible relationship that they've developed. I want to uh, thank the organizers of tonight's uh, meeting, and I want to thank this incredible crowd for coming out. I think it says about the Wheaton campus community that you all care, and you care deeply. And you care deeply about learning, and about learning more about the deepest and most uncomfortable, challenging issues of our time. And so it's a tremendously encouraging to me that that would happen on this campus. And I commend the students that, that traveled to Ferguson last year. And they came back and they shared your experiences. Actually, it was 2014. I haven't turned the calendar yet. And um, so we're fortunate to be on the program tonight with your president, Josh Ford, who was one of those students, and with Dr. Theon Hill, who's been so instrumental in some of the conversations that we've had a chance to, to be privy to. So why are we here at, at Wheaton to talk about why Ferguson matters? Well, we're here because each one of you is in this incredibly special place. And you have deep and um, wide and robust, to use our word, capacity to serve for many years to come. And because I've had the chance uh, to personally observe from our family experience, countless Wheaton students and graduates, you're gaining here an unparalleled perspective, a foundation of knowledge and experience and relationships that you're going to be, leveraged, be able to leverage because of your common bond of faith in Jesus Christ to change the world. And you're going to bring hope where hope doesn't exist. And so your willingness to come here tonight to consider what really in many parts of our country are hopeless situations and say, we're going to engage in that is very encouraging to me. Before we began this work, um, last no uh, the November of 2014, my co-chair and I, Reverend Starsky Wilson, had, we'd prayed deeply around his conference table about whether we should take this. And we knew each other and we regard ourselves as brothers. In Christ, and at the suggestion of my wife Sharon, who's here tonight and who's been my partner on this journey, 
we went with Starsky and his wife Latoya to Ferguson and we spent some time and dinner and conversation and then late at night we went to the altar of Christ the King, United Church of Christ. A church where the first encounters between the leaders of the protest community and the government elected officials had occurred and confrontations and deep conversations that didn't resolve the circumstance that occurred and we knelt there at the altar with the cranes of peace that actually got started after 9-11 at some of the churches around the World Trade Center Ground Zero site. And they had come to Ferguson after going to Cincinnati and other places of tragedy. And they were there on the altar in a deeply emotional moment. We sat there together and then we began to kneel and we prayed. And Starsky quoted um, a psalm, psalm of ascent that reminded us that when you face a mountain, um, you lift up your eyes to the source of help. And that's the way you will find that heaven and earth will not let your foot slip and will watch over you. And that's been our lived experience through this, is that reliance when things seemed insurmountable. You know, commissions don't solve problems. You know, government commissions, most of us are pretty skeptical about what happens. But when the diverse group of people came together, commission members like the two of my colleagues who I'm grateful for here tonight, they were stalwarts on the commission. And they stayed with the work when it was incredibly frustrating, when we wanted to quit and we wanted to go home and we were tired of being yelled at and we were frustrated because we couldn't find agreement. But they gave their time to not only the commission but to come now to begin to share this story. And we had hundreds of working group members and 30,000 volunteer hours and 3,000 people came to over 63 meetings because it was important for us to listen and then for the commission to become united around this common bond of faith that many of us had. And Starsky and I worked hard to model a relationship uh, together as co-chairs that said, we're going to build this relationship on a model of serving each other and serving our fellow commissioners and serving our community. And in modeling that servant attitude, we're going to be able to say that we're committed, even though we may disagree on theology or we may disagree on public policy, but we're going to show that because we have a common bond of responding to Christ's call for social justice, maybe in different ways, but we're going to show you don't have to be able to see eye to eye to walk arm in arm together. So biblical social justice, really, it's a, it's a simple concept. I think Tim Keller in his book, Generous Justice, does a great job uh, describing that the practical application of God's grace uh, that's shared freely through evangelism and relief and development and social reform. And each one of those has a degree of importance. Evangelism, of course, our, of course, our highest calling. Relief, relieving immediate needs, development, helping to bring, uh, bring economic activity. But we spent most of our time on the last principle that, that uh, Keller talked about social reform. That is, how do you change the conditions? How do you change the policies so that the underlying conditions that the governor charged us to look at, how could those become uh, a, a factor that removed hopelessness by the way in which we recommended changes and ultimately they were adopted? And so ultimately, this became our work. How do we respond to, for those of us with face, to the call for biblical social justice, particularly as it related to social reform? And so, like for Kevin and Felicia, for me, this was in a time of incredible introspection, personally. I had to examine my own heart. I had to examine my own biases coming from my peer group and my community and my upbringing and realizing that I had to learn the hard lessons from the people who had lived in justice and poverty and racial uh, inequities and um, incredible, incredible systemic issues. You know, 50 years after Selma, it could be that Ferguson has perhaps become the new Selma. And we were living that reality over the 13 months, listening to the people who were every day reflecting what they were learning. And so we had this bold experiment in inclusive democracy where we invited people to the table so they could set the agenda, not so the power establishment of St. Louis could somehow say these are the solutions. We listen to the community to get those solutions. And, and while we don't know what happens to this in terms of it being an example, because we have our own challenges in St. Louis, the Washington Post called it remarkably constructive. And they said this could be a blueprint to improve life not only in Ferguson and elsewhere around St. Louis, but maybe in many places where underprivileged communities have been mistreated. So let me just real quickly share three thoughts with you and, and um, then we're anxious to hear from Dr. Hill and I'm most anxious to hear from Josh and then, then from you. You know, forward through Ferguson, uh, it matters because many things um, that make our nation great 
but many of the things that make our nation great yet reveal the uncomfortable truths um, that we've long avoided. And that systemic racial inequity that's revealed by those uncomfortable truths requires us to answer that call of grace that's been so freely given to us. And so we said right up front in the report, we were honest to a fault with it, we said, make no mistake, this is about race. And you can label it however you want to do it, but the racial inequities that were revealed by the underlying circumstances that we found were real. Because when predatory ticketing practices result in warrants and incarceration for those least able to handle them, that's a racial inequity and it's systemic racism. When failing or underperforming schools trap the most vulnerable students in poverty, that's systemic. And it's systemic in a racial disparity way. And when a zip code is predictive of your life expectancy, that's systemic racism. And you have to call it for what it is. And while we may have trouble with the words, and we may have to bring people along with the language, I think we have to find that secondly, forward through Ferguson matters because common ground really is found only when leaders and communities uh, form real relationships, to build on Kevin's comment, and seek that social reform that's part of biblical social justice. And we found far more common ground than we ever expected. When Starsky and I appointed Kevin's working group, we said there's no way this group is going to agree on use of force guidelines, on racial profiling, on community policing, on officer wellness. It was just uh, almost totally out of, uh, out of the realm of reality. Yet they did, and they did because they stayed at the table and because people like Kevin and Rasheen formed relationships so they could find ways to build on common ground. And so we called for this unflinching racial equity lens to be applied to public policies, to not-for-profit programs, uh, to businesses, to say before you enact a policy, before you do a program, think about what the impact Missouri General Assembly is or municipal court or school board. Will this exacerbate a disparity or will this alleviate a disparity? And so it's our hope and our prayer that this racial equity lens will over time begin to place what so often in our community really is typified by rose-colored glasses. And I think it's time that we own up to the fact that that lens needs to be applied because real systemic inequities exist. And finally, uh, Forward Through Ferguson matters because we particularly, as believers, are called to be dealers in hope. And you build on that foundational hope that we have through Jesus Christ to build into a world that is fair, more equitable, and where social justice is something we don't run away from, but we run toward and we embrace. And so that's the clarion call we would have for you in this room tonight and to the Wheaton College community, perhaps more broadly represented here, because too many in our nation live with these hopeless circumstances. And most of those circumstances are beyond what many of us can comprehend. But we're called to engage in those. And we're called to learn that that hopelessness is many times debilitating, and that's going to lead to unrest, and it's going to lead to uprising. And when it does, we have to come to the table knowing that the only true source of, source of hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the church needs to show up here. In the words of your chaplain this morning, there's unfinished business, my friends. And we're called to engage in that unfinished business, and you are uniquely positioned to do that. So because of this unmerited favor that we've been extended in the way we think about our faith, those of us that have resources and privilege, um, we can't forget that we didn't choose to whom or where we were born. And so that eternal grace says, you know, I'm, I'm compelling you because I freely gave you grace. You now need to freely give that grace. And I think that the steps toward racial equity can be accelerated because this generation of Christ followers answers the call toward unfinished business and says, we're going to turn this corner. So our family includes two, um, the next generation of our family includes two Wheaton graduates. Our daughter, Lindsay, graduated here in 08, and then she started her professional life with Teach for America uh, on the front lines of that battle for education equity and now practices law in St. Louis. And by the way, I would commend Teach for America to any of you that are so inclined. It's a tremendous program that addresses uh, and making a real difference. Uh, Lindsay's husband, Jay, graduated in 08 as well, and he now serves on the front lines. His parents are here tonight, uh, one of whom is a Wheaton grad. Uh, serves on the front lines of education equity in a very high-performing charter school in uh, urban St. Louis on the grounds of a former public housing district. 
at uh, a youth summit that we held on a Saturday. Actually, about a, a, a year ago, yeah. It was at a community college not very far from Ground Zero near Camfield Greens, where Michael Brown lived. And the rule was we were going to hear from only those who are under age 24. And so for four hours, 150 young people came and shared their hopes and their dreams with us. And about halfway through, someone approached the microphone, had his hood up, took his hood off, and it was obvious he was over 24. And he said, I know I'm not supposed to be here. He said, I beg you, listen to me. And of course we did. And we sat on a front row like this and had no barriers between us and the people we were listening to. And he began to tell his story. He said, I went to school in the city of St. Louis and we didn't have textbooks. And we didn't have enough teachers who cared about us. And I didn't get a very good education. He said, so my prospects are limited. I'm kind of in a dead end job. He said, I live in Canfield where Michael Brown lived. He said, I watched what happened on August 9th. I watched his body lie there for four and a half hours. He said, I'm going to stay. A lot of my neighbors are leaving, but I'm going to stay because we're going to make our neighborhood better. And then he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a picture and he handed it to the first commissioner down on the end of the row. And he said, I want you to look at this picture. He says, it's a picture of my one and a half year old son. And he said, I want for him a better future than I have. And looking at us, he said, I want you to make sure he has education opportunities that lead him to jobs that are not dead end jobs, but lead him to more opportunity than I could ever dream about. And he said, I want you to pass it down and each of you look at that picture and remember what he looks like because that is who we are called to alleviate these racial inequities for. And he was asking the commission, but he was really begging all of us in St. Louis and in many ways uh, collectively begging all of us here, make sure he has a chance. Well, we have a grandson that's not too far away from his age. And as I thought about that, I thought, what if our grandson Harrison and this young man's son could have the same education opportunity and could grow up together and have the same ability to get an education to succeed and the racial inequalities that are so pervasive now were somehow alleviated. And if they knew each other and were talking 20 years from now and said, you know, that's how it was back then, but that's not how it is now. And I think we can turn this corner, but it will take this kind of incredible energy that's represented here tonight and that's been on your campus for the last year and a half and that you're going to hear about from Dr. Hill and from Josh in order to answer that call to address the unfinished business. Thank you. Good evening, Wheaton College. Well, let me just thank the organizers and our panelists for being a part of this important discussion. In 1967, Dr. King stood before the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and he raised a simple question. If I had to guess, I would imagine this question is on many of your minds. And that question was simply, where do we go from here? One thing that's become clear in the year since Ferguson became a major news story, we are tired. I see it in your faces when you sit in my classes and the issue of race comes up and I see students recoil because they're not sure what to say. I see it when you come to my office crying, saying, Dr. Hill, I don't know what to do and I don't know where to go. All I know is that something needs to happen. Where do we go from here? As an evangelical community, that question strikes me three ways. There's three things we need to consider. First of all, why does this issue matter to the evangelical community? Second, what can the church do to address this issue? And third, why are there reasons for hope, even in these dark days of racial inequality? Why does it matter to the church what happens in Ferguson or Baltimore or Staten Island or North Carolina or Charleston? First of all, when we fail to engage the issue of race, we challenge the legitimacy of the gospel. 
James Baldwin said in his classic, The Fire Next Time, if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him. Obviously, we would reject, we would reject the functional approach that Baldwin took when it came to God, but we have to say the brother's making a point. If God has nothing to say about race in America, if God has nothing to say about inequalities, if God has nothing to say about what people of color face on a daily basis, then why do we place our faith in him? It's a valid question to raise. And so when we think about how it challenges our legitimacy, we as an evangelical community love to articulate our voice when it comes to issue of where life begins. We love to talk about issues of sexuality, but so many times secular society looks at us and say, y'all haven't got it right on race yet. So why should we listen to you talk about these other things? You talk so much about God, but why should we listen to you when you can't treat your neighbor with love? Our inability to deal with race challenges the legitimacy of the gospel we claim to hold so dear. It's not just that it challenges the legitimacy of the gospel, but you know what? We as evangelicals, we don't like to talk about the issue. I mean, not just do we have faulty views often, but we like to avoid it. In 2012, 64% of evangelicals in a survey said that the most effective way to improve race relations was to stop talking about race. What happens when we do that, not just do we challenge the legitimacy of the gospel, but we marginalize the power of the gospel. Taking God out of our contemporary discussions on race, putting him on the sideline, is kind of like putting Michael Jordan on the bench for game six. Why would you enter one of your biggest battles without your greatest source of power? Let me tell you this, if I, can trust, if I can trust God for my eternal salvation, I can trust him to help us get along. Why are we going to marginalize the power of the gospel in that area? What does Romans say? It is the power of God unto salvation, unto salvation. That includes everything up to salvation, including race. So we cannot, as an evangelical community, marginalize the power of gospel. That means we have to engage it. That means we have to consider passages like Galatians 2, like Ephesians 3, and say, what does the word of God say about how I should love my brother or sister who's different than me? We cannot leave God out of this discussion. And third, it matters to us because when we fail in this area, we sin by failing to preserve the unity of the spirit. Here's an interesting fact. Our evangelical churches are more segregated than the mainstream society. There's more segregation in the church than there is in the society at large. That's disgraceful. When our faith says it pulls us together, that when we cling to the cross, we're not only clinging to the cross, but we're clinging to people who are also clinging to the cross. So why does it matter? Because when it comes to racial unity and transcending some of these divides and overcoming some of these inequalities which plague our society, it gets at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. When it comes to what our churches can do, first of all, our churches, especially in an age in which there's so many tensions between police and minority communities, our churches can serve as a bridge between that divide. Our churches can serve as a sp safe space for community members, for police officers to come together and talk about it to raise crit critical questions. We can show the love, and so even though we might disagree, we still have something important to talk about. Second, we must be committed for our churches to model the diversity of the body of Christ. How can we call the world to do something if we're not willing to do it ourselves? It's easy to go to churches where people look like you, but guess what? Sometimes you need to make yourself uncomfortable. Third, the church can live out the implications of the gospel in society. It's wonderful to talk about streets of gold, but sometimes we need to know what our brothers and sisters face on a daily basis. Sometimes we as a church need to exercise our prophetic, our prophetic capacity and speak against social injustices. 
I have no problem with us talking about when life begins. I have no problem with us talking about sexuality. But sometime we need to talk about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, recognizing that's part of loving God with all our heart, soul, and might. And then I'm going to stay on time, so I'm going to start wrapping things up. <laughs> the question we have to ask in 2016, is there any cause for hope? I had a really rough experience at the end of semester. It was the week of finals, and I had a student come to my office and say, Dr. Hill, can we talk? And can I close the door? I'm like, sure. And I didn't know what to expect. But this student asked, he's like, Dr. Hill, I'm looking at this situation this racial divide in our nation, and I'm depressed. Is there any cause for hope? He's not alone. Anytime my wife and I watch an episode of The Wire, she looks at me, Theon, is there any reason for hope? <laughs> According to a 2015 Gallup poll, 70% of Americans, or for only 45% of Americans held a positive view of race in America the lowest level in over 15 years. We live in some dark days. We live in some racially divided days. Where do we find hope when the killing of Tamir Rice is deemed to be reasonable? Where do we find hope when our brothers and sisters in Flint, Michigan can't get clean water to drink? Our hope has to be in the Lord and his power to not only change our hearts, but to change society. So where do I ground my hope? I ground it when I have a student come to my office and say, Dr. Hill, I grew up racist, but Jesus changed my heart. I find hope when I see legislators who for years pushed against this saying, we gotta take down the Confederate flag. I find hope when we say, we gotta reform our criminal justice system because of the reality of mass incarceration. I find hope because in the immortal words of Kendrick Lamar, <laughs> if God's got us, then we're going to be all right. <laughs> now I'd like to invite Josh to come up and to give his response. Hello, everyone. How are we? How are we? Cool. I've been taught that every text has a context. And we're here to talk about pursuing justice, uh, restorative justice, mind you, uh, in the text and the context of Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, I've been asked to talk briefly about where I've been, uh, what's been said already, uh, and where we can go from here. Uh, so where I've been. One of the reasons I'm here is because uh, of the time that I spent uh, back in 2014 protesting in Ferguson. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, those who I traveled with, uh, those who aren't speaking here tonight. And that's Andrea Artis, Ali Artis, Sammy Mallow, Annika Bauasma, Maurice Bakanga, Kyle Johnson, Johnston, and my brother Jay Fort. Uh, if you get the opportunity, go and talk with those students uh, because they have a lot to say. That's just not going to be said tonight. Um, because when I went down with the group, uh, my decision was marked by hesitancy. And I, it, it, the hesitancy wasn't grounded in fear. It was hesitancy that was grounded in uh, a worry concerning the difference between loudness and clarity. And when I thought about the protests that were going on and whether or not I should go down to protest, I asked myself whether or not uh, protests were beneficial because I knew that protests were loud, uh, but I didn't know if they were clear. I didn't know if the messages that people wanted to communicate were adequately communicated inside the context of protests. But one of the things that uh, one of my friends convinced me of was that there were larger issues at play 
like larger issues that we couldn't we couldn't live with ourselves if, if we remained silent about. And some of those larger issues are issues of implicit bias, of snap judgments, of fear, the need for police accountability, police training, police support, the need for reform of our criminal justice system, and the valuation of black lives. Now, please don't stop me if you've heard this before, but black lives matter. And they don't matter more than most, but they do matter more than society treats them, treats us, treats me. There are a lot of things that I saw uh, while I was down in Ferguson, including uh, those who introduced themselves as white anarchists. And I encourage you to ask this group about uh, those who would travel into town from out of town uh, and introduce themselves as anarchists from one color or another. Uh, but one of the things that I saw that impacted me most while I was there um, was the place where Michael Brown uh, was killed. And standing there in the middle of the street uh, with the outline of his body there in the middle of the pavement, looking around a neighborhood that's not too different from some of the neighborhoods that I grew up in, Ferguson looked a bit different. That made me see life differently. But I'm also going to talk a bit about what I've just heard. I've heard Felicia say that uh, there's a need for us to listen to the community, uh, the communities that we're trying to help uh, because that should shape our response to the problems that exist and that we need to start with the members of the community that we're seeking to serve uh, and build our solutions out from there. Uh, I've also heard her share about prayer and disruption. And I think that as Christians, we always should begin whatever we're doing in prayer. But I think that as Christians, we also need to keep in mind that there is a time and place for thoughtful, intentional disruption. Uh, I've heard Kevin talk about uh, listening and having to listen because protesters were loud. Um, but he also shared about the clarity of conversations that were had following protests. He shared about collaboration and clarity and, and we need both loudness and clarity if we're going to bring about change. I heard Rich talk about the relationships that can be formed by this type of engagement uh, and the need for us to prioritize relationships grounded in service to one another. Remembering like Rich said, that at times, even when we can't see eye to eye, we can still walk arm in arm. The need for unity is especially poignant in the context that we find ourselves in, in the midst of the, the current set of really challenging circumstances. Doc Hawk, for those of you who aren't picking up on that reference, uh, here on this campus, the need for unity is huge. And like Rich said, we all should examine our hearts because all of us, myself included, start out with ignorance whenever we're entering into any type of conversation. And the goal, regardless of who you are or what you look like, is to take that level of ignorance and lower it. And as Dr. Hill's speech reminds us, we need to be mindful of our history. We need to read scholars like James Baldwin, and we need to <laughs> study to show ourselves approved. We also need to ask the questions, why does race relations matter to the church, and where do we go from here? On the topic of where we go from here, uh, I wanted to mention that in my time at Wheaton, I've heard Many of us share that we're tired of talking about diversity. We're tired of talking about race. Um, I want to correct that a bit. I think the more accurate statement is we're tired of talking about the need to talk about diversity. We're tired of talking about the need to talk about race. One of the reasons why we're here is because this is a time for us to actually talk about the issues themselves and not just talk about the need to talk about them. That's why we've in, in, invited 
and excuse the term, our elders here to share with us. <laughs> uh, to reference a song by John Legend in Common uh, that they had uh, called Glory, featured at the end of Selma, it's MLK weekend and whatnot coming up. Um, the biggest weapon is to stay peaceful. We sing our music is the cuts that we bleed through. Somewhere in the dream we had an epiphany and now we right the wrongs in history. No one can win the war individually. It takes the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. That's you, by the way. Uh, welcome to the story we call victory. Coming of the Lord, my eyes have seen the glory. And it goes on. As Christians, we need to remember to prioritize not just orthodoxy, but orthopraxy, not just right doctrine, but right action paired with that right belief. And Micah 6, 8 tells us, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. As we ask questions of these, our elders, let's keep that in mind. Thank you, Josh. As Josh joins us, and before I uh, encourage everyone to ask questions and not uh, use other forms of discourse, um, I just want to address one thing that, having taught 16 years at Wheaton College, that could be the case for some of you. You've heard Rich say that in the Ferguson Commission, they discovered that this is absolutely about race. And sometimes when people hear people say, say that, you want a wall to go up and, and maybe you think, you know, uh, do we have to talk about race or are people making too much about race? Or if people talk about Black Lives Matter, why are they making race a thing? The thing you have to recognize is that they wouldn't be making race a thing if other people didn't make race a thing in the history of the modern West. It's that making race a thing in the history of the modern West that puts us where we are and why we're doing this. It wasn't people of a darker hue who were making too much of race. It was other people who were making too much of race that caused the problems. Because they had the power. They were the ones building society. And they made too much of race. And we're still dealing with the wake of that. So if you think that we shouldn't be talking about race, it's a great thing that we could wish we, weren't, we didn't have to talk about, but it's part of the world that's been made for us. And there's a lot for us to deal with. And it takes tremendous courage to say that it's still something to deal with. But I want to encourage us to have that courage and as our panelists have indicated, to have hope to get through the difficult conversations, the difficult actions. Because if you get involved in this kind of thing, as I think they'll testify, you may be tempted to say, I just can't go on with this. And I just wanna say, have courage and be hopeful and keep going. And it's okay if you can't solve it but keep going on. So, the three microphones. We invite you to come and to raise questions to our panel. And the reason I keep using the word questions is because I've been in many forums of different kinds uh, where questions have been uh, supposed questions, but they're masqueraded as forms of longer discourse. So, um, especially given the size of the audience and sometimes what happens with momentum of questions, we like to at least give time for as many people to raise their questions as possible. So you arrived first. Good evening. Um, 
going off of uh, what Mr. President said, um, orthodoxy versus orthopraxy, uh, in my life as a white male, I find the theology of, of the gospel very compelling in regards to issues of race, but I find that the social inertia of my life has carried me into predominantly white communities, uh, and so I have a social network that isn't reflective of the theology that I find compelling. So I, I know that the solution to that is to be intentional about building bridges, building friendships with people of color, with people from different cultural backgrounds, but with that, I have a fear that I'll fall into tokenism. Like, oh, you're black, can we be friends? Because I need more black friends, you know? And that can be destructive um, and, and, you know, reductive, not treating people as full human beings. Um, and so it's difficult for me to know, how, what does intentionality look like? Where do I start when I am trying to, like, in a way, get more black friends, but in a way that's legitimate and not reductive, you know? You know what I mean? What's up, Chris? Good to see you. Good to see you, Josh. I'll respond to your text later. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that I would say about that um, is the need for us to change our networks and then to change our networks. And so I think you could say change your networks and mean two things by that. Uh, the first would be to, like you said, to expand your network and to put yourself uh, in different communities, to surround yourself in different contexts where not by just going up and saying like, oh, you're the, the one black person in the room or you're the one Asian person in the room, so I'm going to introduce myself to you, but putting yourself in context where you're surrounded by people who are different so that as you're meeting anybody and everybody, you're beginning to learn and expand your network. Um, but the other way of looking at changing your network um, is to look at the network that you're in, the community that you're, you're already surrounded by, uh, and to think about what it looks like to help change the way they're seeing things, to tweak their worldview so that they begin to look at the world differently. Uh, so I would keep in mind the idea of changing your network and then also changing your network. Thank well, you. Was there a way in which uh, that dynamic was at least a subtext on the commission at all, where some people were nervous in terms of how, how those relationships would work out? Uh, yeah, and it actually builds on the answer that I'd, I'd want to give to, to you. And, and let me first of all say, by way of encouragement, if you think this is hard for you and your generation, you know, think about my generation and my peer group, right? And so the, the, the thought would be, as the commission found, when you're doing real work together, that's where real authentic relationships are formed. You approach that work humbly. We approached it knowing that we didn't know what we didn't know. And we know we needed to learn and we needed to learn together and we needed to do the work together. And that's how we formed relationships off of, uh, it was by doing real work and that led to real relationships. Thanks, Dr. McCoy. Uh, good evening. I uh, just want to say thanks to all the panelists for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, I have a question that I want to direct specifically to Mr. Albrin first, and then I would like all the other panelists to respond if that's okay. Uh, what do you think has been the most uh, significant change in perspective for you? Or what's the most unexpected thing that you learned after uh, serving on the commission? And the reason I asked Mr. Albrin uh, to go first, because I think the way that I have received this narrative is just uh, coming from a law enforcement background, it always seems like uh, perhaps there, that is the greatest degree of, of distance or maybe the lack of proximity. So, you know, what is the biggest thing that you have learned having come out of this experience for uh, you and then for the rest of you? Well, I, I think one of the, when we really got down the brass tacks and, and really started um, taking a deep dive and saying, hey, what, what, what started this rift or, or what broke these relationships between uh, communities and law enforcement or, or relationships that weren't even there. Um, my opinion is, uh, um, and it's a, it's a really, really complicated issue, but it gets back down to relationships. Uh, all across the country when we had the economic downturn, 
city started losing money. Uh, police departments, public safety were, were one of the first things to get hit. Uh, subsequently, uh, there weren't as many police officers on the street. Late 80s, and, and I know things weren't, uh, I think in late 80s we were really starting to make some inroads because we had a lot of these community-oriented programs going. Um, um, a great number of police officers, they started cutting the police officers which means they didn't have the officers to, to do these community programs anymore. Um, and, and this is gonna sound kind of simplistic. It makes perfect sense in my head. I just have a trouble articulating it sometimes. So we're part of a government operation uh, run by mayors. Uh, mayors get complaints from the people. What do the people want? When I call, when I call 911, I want the police to come. Well, when you start cutting away uh, the amount of police officers, they don't have the time to uh, go to the house where, where the mother is having a problem with her 14-year-old uh, juvenile daughter that's running into problems because they're getting it from the top down and saying, you gotta answer these calls quickly. Um, and I don't think that's one of the very, that's one of the issues that, that I know um, happened which goes to about, about relationships, because cops couldn't get out of their cars, but couldn't spend the time to get out of their cars and really get to know um, their communities. Uh, I, I said this before, uh, when I graduated from the police academy uh, and St. Louis summers are hot, um, my, my, my first job all summer was, hey kid, you're not riding around in an air conditioned police car, you're walking this beat in this neighborhood for four months and you're getting, to, getting gonna get to know the community. We've gotten away from that. Um, they come up with all these buzz buzzwords, uh, cops, community-oriented policing, problem-oriented policing, but I'll tell you what, it's what good police work has been since the beginning of time. Knowing the people that you're serving in your neighborhood and solving their problems rather than just uh, answering and going from call to call to call. So I, I'm really passionate about, about getting uh, that we're getting that message out. The other, the other big thing I learned, and we talked about this earlier today too, hey, I was a big proponent of an officer wellness uh, proportion of our, of our recommendations. Because what a lot of people didn't realize, if an officer is depressed, if he's got a substance abuse problem, if he's got a mental health issue, um, do you think that's gonna affect the way he treats people in the community when he's at work? So um, I think we need, uh, I think we really need to get in, more involved in, in looking at the individual uh, health of the officer. Uh, we talked about, and, and I'll let, you said it so eloquently earlier about um, how some people don't even think that they're, that they're being racist. Do you remember when they we talked? They don't even know that there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, F Felicia can say this much better than I, but this is a great thing that, that I learned. And I'm thinking, wow, so you hit it spot on. Um, so we were asked this question as a body about a third into our meetings. Um, just sort of pause, like, what have you learned? And one of my greatest points of learning, although there were many, um, but one of my greatest points of learning coming from a grassroots background, coming from a community servant background, where I've been in distressed communities, trying to solve this problem of poverty, and, and like I said, help people find a path to self-determination. And um, it's difficult work, right? You're struggling against systems and, and power structures and hopelessness and lack of resources. Um, and after doing that for, for such a long time, you, know, you get really frustrated. So I was in the, you know, in the world thinking anybody that isn't on my team helping me solve these problems, surely you see the, these problems. And I, you know, if you're not helping me, then you're part of the problem. 
And then I immediately jumped to, not immediately, it took some years for me to get to this conclusion. Not only are you part of the problem, but you're probably helping to perpetuate the problem. So not only are you part of the problem, but you're creating and perpetuating the problem. You're the problem. Um, and in doing the work with the commission, having such diverse perspectives and having an opportunity for a community to come from all over to work with us, and I do mean work with us, bring their stories and ask lots of questions. And I realized, because people came to me very sincerely and very authentically, and where is this happening? And who is it happening to? And who's doing it? And Felicia, has this ever happened to you? And I'm thinking, I've known you for 20 years. Yes, this happens to me. I'm black in America. This happens to me. And just the shock and confusion on their faces. They were like just not knowing that this was happening. So it changed my orientation to the work. And I realized that there's a whole body of good people that are just sincerely oblivious to the conditions of other people and actually what's going on. So um, it made me put, you know, put my educator hat back on and realize that I was going to have to go into these conversations sort of laying it all out and connecting the dots and identifying the systems because I'm telling you, you're part of the system, right? And we're trying to dismantle the system of racism. You don't know that there's a system, so you don't know you're in it. So for young people, I like to say, remember the matrix? When the people were in the matrix, they didn't know there was a matrix, right? They're like, what are you talking about? So they took the pill and they broke out of it and dude was like, oh, that matrix thing, can I go back where the steak is juicy, right? Because this reality thing is not as good as being in the matrix. But now we're out, right? So that's, that was my greatest learning is that people didn't know. We have to help them see it. Uh, the question to ask all of us to respond, I'll be brief because I see you're lined up and I'm, I'm glad to, to have, we have the chance to respond to those questions. I think I would say this, that the cumulative weight of the, the underlying causes that we documented, infant mortality, violence in communities, life expectancy gaps, uh, education uh, inadequacy at uh, extraordinary levels, lack of economic opportunity, poor transportation, and those factors were not just present one at a time, they're present in multiple circumstances. And in my life and in my world in the bubble in which I live, if I had any one of those factors, I would be going crazy trying to figure out how to solve it. But these communities have multiple, if not all of those factors going at the same time, and that was a key learning for me. Dr. McCoy. So, uh, not even knowing about this event, over break I decided I just wanted to sit down and actually read the report. And so I made it about halfway through, and it was simultaneously <laughs> heartbreaking, but also I felt so glad that someone was writing about this. And so, to learn that you were praying going into this. I just want you to know I felt the power of your prayers. I thank you for your prayers. It's felt in the report. Wow. And when you say that it's about race, it's very clearly about race. And it's about a population that's targeted because of their race, because they're poor, because they're black. But the reason they're being targeted is apparently because the city's broke, or at least they're really suffering financially. And so I'm wondering, because um, unfortunately I didn't make it to the end of the report, so I don't know if you mentioned this at the end. Okay, you made it further than most. Um, <laughs> I'm determined to make it there. Yeah, to the extent, what were recommendations or what discussions have you been a part of or that you're aware of about actually bringing finances back to this community so that poor people of color are not targeted by their own government in order to raise money? Yeah, great, great question. I think it, it gets to the question of, of the larger issue of the engagement with the body politic. Because as Christians, we're not called to be separate from what happens in public policy. We're called to be a part of it. And we're called to bring an informed influence, in this case, I think, a biblical social justice to that. So you can, you know, people can have different views about public policy and, and the right administration, but at the end of the day, government is here to serve the people, right? And so what we found is that in particular areas of concentrations of poverty, that the, the furthest thing from that was happening. 
And it was because cities, in effect, were not real cities, right? They, I'm sorry, stop saying right. <laughs> the, the, the cities were just not equipped to um, provide the kinds of services with, or have the tax base. And so as a result, they were doing predatory ticketing practices, adding fines, and it was result in horrendous citizen law enforcement relations. And the police officers were not at fault. They were being told, do this. And so now you have Kevin's people out there at odds with their citizenry, and those encounters were yielding uh, worse and worse results. And so the answer is you reform the government. And so some of the legislation that Kevin referred to uh, <laughs> will over time, we believe, I believe personally, force consolidation so cities are real cities and they have real trained police forces and have the revenue base to support them because the waste that's occurring in the tax dollars that are going from these fragmented municipalities. And that's just one example and we could probably start drilling down and find a lot more, but that was in my mind low hanging fruit um, in order for us to be able to, to get cities more responsive to their citizens. Um, how does someone like me, a white person, appropriately and publicly empathize and seek social justice specifically regarding race without assuming a victim position or becoming a voice for someone else's cause and personal story? Well, here's uh, one way to answer that is uh, there is no one way to do that because everybody doesn't have the same story every, or your relationships with people are with all kinds of people. So every minority you meet doesn't ha hasn't had the same experience. Some people are like, I haven't had that experience. I've never been pulled over for DWB driving wild black. I'm good, right? Like I haven't had that experience, my brother has, right? So uh, I th what I would say is be authentic in relationships, be honest about what you don't know, be honest about the fact that you care and just deal with the discomfort when there are those moments when some, because sometimes, sometimes you, you're trying to be helpful and sometimes somebody, you know, they, they blow up, right? And then, you know, uh, try to be an agent of compassion in those moments, but don't leave. And just stay at it and just recognize it just like you would with any other set of relationships. If you're really interested in being somebody's friend, you don't just uh, impose what you believe on them, you ask lots of questions. And just keep asking questions. And I think if you, as long as you keep having that kind of posture and people see that you genuinely care about you, then I think you'll, you'll, you'll see how to do that. Hello. Uh, Dr. Uh, Theon Hill. Yes, sir. In your presentation, you raised a point that I've been thinking about a lot recently, and you're talking about segregation in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have some friends who go to a pro predominantly Korean church, predominantly Chinese church. Uh, I grew up traditional Scandinavian Lutheran, which is uh, very predominantly white. And uh, you have commonalities. Um, sometimes you have neighborhoods where there might be a church in the neighborhood and that neighborhood may be dominated by a certain race. There's also our different worship styles. And I, I've just been thinking, I feel like if people of different races came to my traditional Scandinavian church, they might be really bored and confused. <laughs> and I just, I, I feel like diversity is a great thing, mm -hmm. but the question I've been wrestling with is, um, I, I don't know how we can really force it yeah, yeah. in some situations. And I also think it's, it's a great thing, but I don't necessarily think it's a goal. Mm -hmm. um, so I just would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, great questions and thoughts, my brother. Um, a couple of responses. First, I think our goal when it comes to the diversity of our churches needs to be to reflect the diversity of our communities. So if we're in a place like Wheaton, well, Wheaton's not a terribly diverse place. Uh, so every church may not be as integrated as it might be in an Aurora or in an Oak Park. Um, there's just more people. Uh, I'm not gonna cite a church in Kansas the same way that I might cite a church in Bolingbrook, Illinois. It's just a different demographic to deal with. Um, to get to your other issue, just in terms of the differences that lead us to go to churches where people are like us, 
let's just consider this. If our cultural traditions are so essential to how we do church, we need to rethink like how we're doing church. I mean, our culture cannot be so central to the point that it drives someone else away. We need to try to craft a church where everyone feels welcome. We need to try to embrace the differences and the diversity of the body of Christ because guess what? We have something to learn from one another. College Church has something to learn from Wheaton Christian Center. And I suspect Wheaton Christian Center has something to learn from College Church. And in those interactions, we grow as a body. When you come to the black church experience and you see the celebratory nature of the saying and you see the end, the conclusion with the dynamic ending to the sermon, guess what? You're swept up in it. And guess what? When I go to my white brothers and sisters to their churches and I hear the traditional hymns, I hear Mighty Fortresses, Our God, Martin Luther, you know, I learn something as well with the rich doctrinal text. Now, in experiencing that, it may be uncomfortable at first, but our goal for that is to craft a church where the body is free to be different and diverse and to reflect the diversity that is true of the body of Christ. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to answer your question a bit too. I know it wasn't directed at me, um, but you said two things. One concerning um, forcing it and the other uh, concerning whether or not it was worth it. I uh, wanted to start by just giving you like a point to, to go and research later uh, concerning the fact that the reason the segregated churches dynamic was cre created in the first place was because it was forced, because churches were not always segregated. At one point, there were black people in the black section of the white church, uh, and then they were told to leave. Um, and that's when you start to see kind of the creation of these churches of different cultures, not because that just happened naturally, but because it happened artificially. Uh, and people were once together, but they were made to be apart. Uh, and then you get the creation of, of different styles of worship and so on and so forth. Um, the second thing with the benefit uh, of forcing it, one of the things that I was told earlier on in my college career was that if, like before you graduate, uh, you need to put yourself underneath the leadership of someone who looks different than you. Uh, because doing that changes your perspective. Growing up, uh, I always attended as my home churches, predominantly African American churches, and I love them, and I love the preaching, and I love the worship, and I love the style, and I love the community. It's all fantastic. Um, but during my time at Wheaton, I've spent the last three and a half years uh, at the Compass Church down on Roosevelt Road, which is predominantly white, and by predominantly like 80, 90, 95%. Um, and my Sunday school teacher um, is a guy named Ron who's white. And that experience, while I can't say it's without its challenges, is worth it. Coming here, uh, coming back for the semester, uh, I woke up on Sunday morning and knew that I had the opportunity to go and, and keep going to college church, or not college church, but to my, my church home here in college, Compass. Um, but to be honest, I was tired, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back just yet. So for the second time since I've been here at college, I walked down the street to Second Baptist, a predominantly, if not nearly complete, well, no, predominantly African-American church and I experienced the worship, and I experienced the preaching, and I experienced the community. And when they, they asked me to stand and say, like, why are you here? I said, because I needed one more Sunday where I could be at home. It is hard, and it is challenging, but it's worth it. I came from, straight from class, so if you address this, um, before I came, please just skip me and go to the next person. But I've heard a lot of people um, respond to the Black Lives Matter movement with the um, rhetoric of all lives matter. And I'm wondering if you could talk about maybe what is helpful and intended generally behind that meaning and what is unhelpful and unintended behind that kind of rhetoric as a response to Black Lives Matter. You mean to the all lives matter? What's helpful about that rhetoric? Particularly what's unhelpful about that rhetoric. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's, well, 
it's helpful in the sense that thank you for reminding us that we should be caring about all human beings. It's unhelpful in that it obscures the reason why people are using the phrase Black Lives Matter. And it winds up being a, you like this, whitewashing device of, uh, so, so that people don't have to think about some of the difficult things they were talking about they dealt with on the commission. Um, and it, as I was saying earlier, uh, people want to say that because I don't understand why they keep talking about that. To which one should say, um, look at the history of the modern West and that's why. Because it was in the history of the modern West that people made race a thing. They created race because it's a, it's a fictive reality. It's not real. I mean, how many people are actually white? You know what I'm saying, right? So, uh, but, but the creation of that, uh, which also meant that there are people who weren't, uh, led to this world that we have that made it uh, a situation where we still need to say Black Lives Matter because uh, there are people who still would rather be bleaching it out. You know? Um, not necessarily uh, intentionally, but what, what was that word you used about, uh, uh, it was a great phrase, about what, um, sincerely. And authentically? Yeah, sincerely, uh, 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 sincerely oblivious. Oh, sincerely oblivious, yes. yes. Well, I, think, I think that's what happens, people are sincerely oblivious. Because they don't understand why race is a problem. And, but, but and you have to say there, Say, well, think about this. Who ran the slave trade? Who instituted Jim Crow? What was their, what was their pigmentation? And then ask who made race an issue? And say, we're still dealing with it. And that's why you gotta say Black Lives Matter. And, and for me, I'd just like to offer something. It's important to say that Black Lives Matter because there are very specific issues that black people confront in this country that other people just don't have to deal with. Um, and it is literally a matter of life and death. So what we learned in our research is between two zip codes, 63105 and 63106, 10 miles apart, the life expectancy, the difference is 18 years. 18 years. If you're a parent that's from the moment you see that beautiful baby till you drop them off to the college or university of their choice, 18 years. And so the infant mortality rate in our community is comparable to a third world country. And you might think, well, what are those black women doing? Let's have a program and help them have healthy babies. But it's not about what we're doing, it's about the conditions that we live under when we're trying to create life. Toxic stress <laughs> is literally killing our children. Because if you move here in black and brown skin, move to America in black and brown skin, what we know is that within seven years, you've adopted the same stress levels and health conditions that we live with daily and are subject to those same infant mortality rates. And we say the Black Lives Matter because Tamir Rice was 12 years old and within a second he was dead in a park. And so there are things that are happening to us that we need everyone to pay attention to because they're literally a matter of life and death. And when I say that I love myself, I love my family, I love my community, that black lives matter, I don't understand how you hear other lives aren't important. So I question the interpretation of the hearer because that's not what I said. I'm talking about me, quite frankly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I get to do that. I get to talk about me. And um, you know, think about what you're hearing and why you're interpreting it that way, because surely that's not what we're communicating. I think this is where thoughtful believers can come to the table and say, you know what, we need to listen more deeply. Because the way Felicia described why the phrase black lives matter makes a difference to her 
was about far more than someone who pejoratively say, well, all lives matter. Well, there's a much deeper feeling behind that. And I think we as followers of Christ have to take time to understand what's behind that feeling and realize that that has true meaning and true significance. Thank you, Rich. Hi, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, my name's Connor and I grew up in Chesterfield, Missouri which is 25 minutes away from Ferguson. Uh, so I grew up with a lot of the ignorance that was perpetuated and is pr my community is almost guilty for a lot of the things that caused Ferguson. Um, so what are practical ways that I can personally work towards um, changing my community um, and changing the ignorance? And what, is, what are ways that the commission have worked towards um, addressing the lack of diversity in my incredibly affluent, um, mostly white community of Chesterfield and West County. I'll, uh, uh, Connor, thanks and uh, nice to see you here today. Nice to see another St. Louis face. Uh, I think that the challenge for uh, the affluent parts of suburban St. Louis and we were invited to St. Charles County with similar characteristics by the county executive there is to realize that um, our position and our, you can call it privilege, you can call it blessing, you can call it whatever you want to, really compels us to, to engage. And you know, despite the fact that geographically you're 10 or 15 miles away from places, engagement uh, has lots of faces and it can, be it can be the way you approach your career, it can be the way you approach your worship to follow Dr. Dr. Hill's idea, or it can be the way you approach your relationships, assuming you go back to, to St. Louis. And I think the more the millennial generation approaches life that way and says, we're going to engage, you know, despite the geography in which we live, that will, as it has in our family, more and more compel your parents as well as your peers and those in between to come alongside you because you'll, you will draw them as a leader uh, to be more engaged. And so I think it's a matter of starting and taking the first step. And so it could be dealing in education, it could be finding ways to be involved in economic development, it could be involved in faith-based ministries, it could be involved in job training programs. I mean, I think you just find where your passion is and you get started. Okay, we'll take these as the last three. Uh, hi everyone, uh, the answer to this question might be similar to some who have already been, been posed, so if that's the case, feel free to just say so. I'm a little too short for this mic. Okay. Um, as Josh pointed out, at Wheaton, we talk a lot about the need to talk about diversity, and very rarely do we actually talk about diversity. It's been my experience that part of the reason why that is is because there are a lot of well-meaning white students who have never really had a conversation about race before, myself included, definitely last year, and are kind of terrified of starting those conversations because we don't want to offend people, we don't want to make generalizations, we have no idea what to say. So what would your advice be to people to just kind of break down that initial barrier of like awkwardness and fear so that we actually can be productive and talk about something in a way that is beneficial? You know, um, I, I just want to say this really, really quickly. Um, I heard the Reverend Tracy Blackman, she's a commissioner, um, and pastor of Christ the King Church say that we recognize that we had to go into this work with grace, with mercy, knowing that we'll need to be forgiven and understanding that we'll need to forgive. Um, so you just go into it you know, with that, again, be authentic and, and be honest. It, it, it won't be a surprise to black people if you start a conversation with them <laughs> that you don't know a lot about black people or, or have those relationships, but generally, um, black people are, are very generous and, and, and forgiving, right? Um, very, very forgiving, so just, and I like to say that you can start with doing some intercommunal work, <laughs> you know? Start with your own work. There are great part um, programs, um, witnessing whiteness. You can read the Ford through Ferguson report you can um, read $2 a Day, Living on Almost Nothing in America. It's a great book that Catherine Eden has just produced. So, so, so you can get a foundation in orientation um, and then come to the conversation with something. And throw in a little Maya Angelou and some other great artists. And you'll, <laughs> you'll be ripe and ready for a conversation. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, building off of, what, well, first off, it's good to see you, Caroline. Uh, second off, building off of what Felicia said, coming into the conversation uh, with that humility and with that recognition that you'll, you'll need grace and that you'll need forgiveness, <coughs> saying that, stating that, but then also telling whoever it is that you're talking to or rather asking them like, hey, I had some questions and I, I'm a bit uncomfortable asking and I know that if I ask them, I'll need forgiveness and I'll need grace at times. Are you willing to have this difficult conversation about race right, right now? Because I know that for many, uh, myself included at times, like, talking about race is very difficult for us as well. And sometimes we just want to take a break. Uh, and so f f like asking the question uh, to see whether or not their energy levels are high or low at that mm -hmm. particular moment, that, that means a lot. Um, and then if, if you ever want to talk to me, I'm always here. <laughs> Thank you. Be courageous and be patient. Uh, like I said, this isn't something you solve like in a sitcom, right? So just, just make it part of your life. Thank you very much. Josh, I loved what you had to say about um, Christians always needing to start from a place of prayer, but also needing to leave room for um, thoughtful, nonviolent disruption. And so I'm particularly interested as, as a person of faith, as a Christian who's personally and professionally committed to uh, engaging in thoughtful disruption. I'm wondering what your relationship as the commission looked like with the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson, with the leaders and organizers who were uh, coordinating and directing all of the protests that were happening on the streets. Yeah. Go ahead, Rich. No, no, go, go, go. Uh, well, and, and, and here's one of the problems during the initial parts of the unrest, and that was a big thing with protesters. We have no leaders. This is a leaderless movement, and, and, and to be honest with you, that was one of the, the law enforcement problems when mm -hmm. law enforcement was trying to identify people and try to set up some ground rules. Okay, you know, this is okay, but this isn't okay. Um, I'm proud to say uh, some of the matter, some of the leaders of, of some of those organizations, OBS, uh, uh, CAPCAR, uh, I've known them for over 10 years, 15 years, because when I was the president of uh, the local, the St. Louis Police Officers Association, I sought those people out and I said, there again, comes back to relationships. Hey, instead of yelling at each other from afar, can we get to know each other and, and figure something out? So uh, from a commission standpoint, um, I knew a lot of those leaders and, and that was hugely beneficial, um, and, and, it, and it, worked, it worked very well. There were a lot of uh, informal leaders that rose up, Rasheen being one of them that, that was extremely helpful uh, during the whole pro process. We, we worked, the answer, direct answer is we worked hard to bring them into the conversation and the table and not coming from me, because they have no re reason to listen to a white CEO. They do have reason to listen to folks who've been on the front lines with them who had agreed to serve on the commission, Rasheen and Brittany and Tracy and Starsky, who could go to them and say, look, we're at this table and we need your voices and we need your help and you may not want to be at a meeting or you may not want to engage in a particular structured way, but talk to us and, and help be a part of the conversation. And they, I think, appropriately started off with a high degree of skepticism. You know, this is the governor who had uh, ordered the National Guard and had taken actions that they uh, significantly disagreed with, had appointed this group. And so the bold step that Rasheen and others took to be a part of it said to them, we're going to try to take constructive action here and be at the table, but we're going to represent your views. And we're going we're to be forceful about that representation. And if we're not, you keep talking to us. And in some working group meetings, they were present and there and at the table um, very visibly and very helpfully. And so I, th I think it's a matter of a relationship, an invitation, a transparency, and an inclusion, and an understanding that you may not agree, not just with the policy recommendations, but you may not all agree with the methodology of articulating those views, but that doesn't change the validity of the view and the need to have it in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And you are the final question. 
Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, Darren Wilson, the man who shot and killed Michael Brown, has been acquitted of all charges. What is your response to this, and how do you think that it affects this conversation? What a way, what a great last question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Things are going so well. Yeah. <laughs> we were not charged with looking at the events of August 9th, and so the commission spent no, uh, no time or no research analyzing what happened in the encounter between Darren Wilson and Michael Brown. That was left to the process and the authorities uh, that looked at those. And so each commissioner has their own individual opinion, I suspect, um, and there's no question that to the broader issue that that encounter has changed not just the conversation, it's changed uh, dramatically, not just Ferguson and not just St. Louis, but the fact that we're here tonight in Wheaton, Illinois, at this college campus talking is because that encounter occurred tragic encounter that you would wish had never occurred, but God is going to use that encounter in a way to bring all of us to our knees and to the table and to work on that unfinished business that you talked about this morning at chapel. So uh, it, it, I think you have to, to now step back and say, okay, what happened with Michael Brown is something that we need to figure out how we can turn that tragedy into a force for good. So before we actually finish, uh, Dr. Ruth Bentley, who's down here, is with us tonight. Uh, she wanted to say something. Uh, she's somebody you should get to know. Obviously, I'm not a Wheaton College student. <laughs> actually finished college here 60 years ago. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, uh, I, I had to be here tonight because this was uh, something that's been on my heart, actually probably going back even before Trayvon Martin. And, but one of the things that, that uh, was triggered in me from the Ferguson thing, from the shooting, uh, was what Officer Wilson said several times, that um, he was, that Mike Brown was so big you remember that? It was a comparison between the bigness of the two, and he was a menace to him. And then I've noticed in several other occasions, uh, bigness was mentioned, well, of course, with Trayvon Martin. He was big. That was one of the things. Um, uh, Eric Garner was big, the one who was uh, killed, choked on the, on the uh, ground. And so I've seen that kind of narrative. And then I also ran across something that said that um, that, that particular stereotype of black, about black men is over 100 years old. It's called the giant Negro syndrome. And, and it, 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 what it speaks of is fear, that people are afraid of black men because they're so big. And it, as I, as it doesn't really matter whether they're big or not because it also was said of Tamir Rice. They said he was big for his age. And I said, oh, <laughs> you know, so all these things kind of began to hit me and at the need for uh, some training, and I, you've, you've mentioned that already, but I really think that some implicit training, not just for police officers, but for, you know, all of us to, to examine those stereotypes that we have of other folk and to see that, that we're bound by them and it's keeping us from really kind of interacting and, 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 and being human with each other. This uh, Laquan um, McDonald in Chicago, that police officer didn't see a black young man who needed to be saved. He, I think he saw a demon and put 16 bullets into him and had to be stopped from reloading. You know, and so, but he didn't see a human being. And I think that we, that the training needs to be, uh, what someone said, implicit bias that we have, that we've got to deal with that so that we can react and re, uh, relate to other folk in a human way, in a Christian way, even beyond the humanist. And so I just wanted to say that at the end, that, you know, that I really think that, you know, I, I hope Wheaton will do more in terms of training and in terms of that bias 
And uh, I have a friend who's a psychologist who has done a lot of training for police departments across the country. And I'm trying to get him into the Chicago Police Department. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, please join me in thanking our guests tonight. And thank all of you for coming and staying till 9.15. We, we didn't even get a 50% exodus. I'm, I'm very happy about this. So thank you so much for coming. And please leave, I hope you leave with uh, hope and courage and a lot of patience but that you will stay with the learning process and that, and that as rich said that you will be the ones who are committed to completing the unfinished business may be said of all of us have a good night <laughs>